Crime, Wine, and Chaos contains adult language and graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Off we go into the wild blue yonder. <laughs> Hi, Chaos Kids. I'm Naomi. I'm Amber, and this is Crime, Wine, and Chaos. <gasps> you did a little jingle there. I haven't been graced with your singing for a while. Thank you for that. I wasn't, the, I wasn't gonna sing it, but then like I started to do, and it's like you can't do it without singing it. Anyway, it was a little foreshadowing. When sort you, of. Oh, know, kind of, kind of. That was what came to my mind. I don't know if it's actually correct to foreshadow it that way, but that's that's what I'm doing. You know what? You know what? I, you sold me on it. I'm curious okay, now. Great, great. <laughs> Hi, sister. Hello. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm doing one of those, like I'm jamming on it now because uh, I'm, I'm hopping on a plane tomorrow. I'm meeting my be- one of my besties at the airport and we are going down to visit with another bestie uh, for the weekend. We're having a late ladies only, mm. you know, mom getaway. You know, Courtney and I are not like actively momming anymore. And I don't know if Susie's almost done actively momming. But anyway, we're going down to LA to visit with Susie. We're going to be gone for a little extra long weekend girl time. I love that for you. And good timing. Like you, you could probably use a heavy dose of that right now, huh? I think I really could. Like part of me is in that space where it's like, I'm still struggling to get out of bed most days. So it feels Herculean Mm -hmm. to like pull my shit together to get to the airport. Right. But I know that once I do and I'm there, it'll be good medicine, you know? For sure. For sure. Therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. How's it, what's up with you? Good. Thank you for asking. You know, it's just been cray. I'm also, well, we're going to miss each other by a week, but I'm going to be in LA the following week. So I'm just jamming out shit at work to try and make sure that I'm not coming back to chaos. Um, uh-huh. You know, just... It's all good. It's all good. Just trying to get ahead of the game. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, every time we get a little ahead of the game, we still end up falling behind at something. Oh, sure. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What are you drinking today? Oh, thank you for asking. I'm drinking a cab, a red called District 7 from Monterey, California. District 7. Yeah. If this was the Hunger Games, we'd be in bleak spot, right? I mean, it kind of is. We kind of do live in the Hunger Games. It's just that we we <laughs> live in the capital, so we don't see the bleakness of the districts from here. So very true, very true. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot. I have a. I have an actual update. Oh, great! Let's hear it. Okay. okay. So, do you recall when I told you guys about the murder of Kristen Huntington, who was a member of the Selawik tribe in Fairbanks, Alaska? Yes. Okay. And the result at the end was when I finished that story that there was a custody battle still going on with her daughter, Chanel. Oh yeah. Who went with the white people instead of staying with her tribe? That's exactly right. Uh That's exactly right. Well, guess, guess who I found on TikTok? (gasps) Her tribe? The family friend who's been speaking since, uh, Kristen's mom wasn't allowed to, because remember she wasn't allowed to say anything publicly because she was in the midst of the custody the battle. ongoing battle. Yeah. So, right. So her friend, her friend was doing the public speaking on their behalf and she has a account on TikTok. And yesterday on March 12th, she posted a TikTok update that baby Chanel has been returned to her grandmother. Yay. Oh, oh. Yay. Mm -hmm. I do Mm -hmm. remember that and how much I love the name Chanel. Oh my gosh. That's the best news. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Oh my gosh. It was like a four year battle. Gosh. She's not even a baby anymore. I was just going to say. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that she has a speedy and happy adjustment and everything is good for them. Well, there some pictures. She posted some pictures on her update and she looks very happy. And there was, looked looked like there was a lot of, a lot of smiles and a lot of hugs. And I'm sure they had a big celebratory family dinner and all the things, you know? Yeah. Good. Well, congrats to grandma and to Chanel. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. (sighs) Okay. Bring us some good news. I was really excited when I saw that yesterday. I'm excited too. 
<laughs> oh gosh. Hey. Those little those little blips of good that the universe drops in is like, okay. Yep. All right. That's there's, exactly right. There's humanity still. Um well that was good timing because I've got one that is creepy for you. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All um, right. Sock it to me. Sister. Yeah, this was real fucking creepy. So I watched this documentary on Netflix called Can I Tell You a Secret? And uh, have you talked to me about this before? I uh, don't think so. Okay. Have you watched just, that? Just No, but it's ringing a bell. Oh, anyway, God. keep going. Sorry. All right. So we're going to start with Abby here. Abby is a fire dancer which is fucking incredible. She's a badass. She shares her performances and her art heavily on Instagram. Okay. I'm introducing you to a couple people here, but it should be followable. Is that a word? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, now. Great. So Leah is also uh, very social and outgoing. She shares all of her moments on social media. Then there's Zoe, who's extremely athletic and loves to travel the world. And she's always out doing something and also sharing all her happy moments on social media. Zoe is also a model and all three young women have a pretty robust following on social media and they all love it. Oh, you know what? I just remembered why I've heard of this. Sorry. <laughs> because somebody in my TikTok, one of my TikTok video comments mentioned having watched this documentary and said that there was something about, is there some web sleuthing in this? Sort of. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were like, I'm not really sure how I feel about the web sleuthers in this particular story. Oh, no, maybe that's a different one. Then. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just, oh, that's okay. I'm now it, it's like itching back here. Like, why am I feel like I've heard of this? Anyway, keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. what are the gals' names again? Zoe, a a Abby, Leah, and Zoe. Abby, Leah, and Zoe. Abby mm -hmm. is the fire dancer. Leah is just kind of an influencer type. Yeah. She also, she actually works as a paralegal, but she's just super active on social media. And Zoe is a model and a okay. tra traveler and all the things. So okay. Lincoln shore, I think I'm saying that right is on the East coast of England. And this is 2017. Zoe is just running errands in her town and she gets an instant message on Instagram from somebody named Tracy, who was also a model and it was just a pretty short, kind message saying, I love your work. I'm also a model. If you ever need any advice, let me know. Like, let's exchange secrets or let's exchange whatever, right? Okay. And Zoe said, thank you. I didn't think much of it because she gets a shit ton of messages and comments on there, you know, quite a bit. So about mm -hmm. a week later, she gets a message on Snapchat, which is a bit unusual because she didn't really use Snapchat. And the message said uh, that he was a photographer and was asking Zoe if she wanted to work with him. Then he Creeper. said, mm -hmm. then there he is some like uh, some sex trafficking ring going on here or something. <laughs> <laughs> you went straight to as dark as it can get. Didn't you? I mean, this is what they do. Oh my God. You're gorgeous. You're go let me take your picture. Mm hmm. Okay. Then this photographer says, can I tell you a secret? Ew. No, mm. no, no, I know. I don't want to know your secrets. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. no. Uh, yeah. And so he's like, sure. Tell me. And says, if I confess, it will spoil our friendship. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'm sorry, but like block, 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 blockity block, like instant. Like we got to be, you guys, everybody be liberal with the block button. That's all I'm saying. Totally. Totally. So Zoe is pretty unsettled by this because she's thinking that there's some sort of harmful rumor floating around about her or something weird like that. And then the messenger says it would be a disaster for us all, Zoe. Okay. So, oh so she's getting weirded out and she's thinking this is not a normal conversation to have with a professional photographer. So she gets on Instagram. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And finds this photographer's page and sends him a DM through Instagram and asks him if he is speaking to her through Snapchat. And he's like, no, I don't have Snapchat. Oh. Uh-huh. 
So she goes back to the Snapchat person and she's like, I know you aren't who you say you are. And then the messenger starts getting like patronizing. And he's saying things like, why do you crave attention? Then he starts rattling off personal things about her that she has no idea how he would know. So fucking creepy. Block, 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 he block. Why is he not blocked yet? Okay. Uh, She tells him that he is freaking her out and she's scared. And he tells her, don't be scared. Then he shows her a fake Facebook page that he made of her with her photos. Ew. Uh Uh-huh. They were just two modeling photos that he obviously copied from her Instagram and had, you know, whatever. So Zoe gets home from her errands, whatever, and gets on her computer and immediately starts investigating. So she sees on the screenshots that this fake account sent her of the Facebook page that he made that he liked one of them on Instagram, but not the others. So like he didn't crop it enough. Like he left that bottom portion where you could see that that Instagram account made a heart on that photo. Okay. Yes. So she sees that. So then she goes onto Instagram and writes down all of the names of the accounts that liked that photo, but not the other one. Cause he took two, he liked one, not the other. And she narrows it down to seven people or seven accounts. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Then in the very far bottom of the photo, there is a little icon that has the profile pic of whoever is on Instagram at the time, you know, mm-hmm. um, the person who screenshotted who, from her Instagram, from Instagram, is the Tracy person who said that they were a model the week before and messaged her. Right. Okay. Right. Whew, sorry. I am not a social media guru, so this was much harder for me to comprehend than it should have been, but you are, so I'm just going to assume you're following along. I'm following along. If I'm not, I'll ask questions. Okay, great. Okay, so great. Deal? Deal. Okay, yeah. So Zoe's like, okay, this woman's weird and she makes a post on Facebook that this wackadoo has made a fake account of her and not to engage with her. And then the photographer that was legit contacts Zoe and says, he, Hey, just a heads up. I know Tracy personally, and this isn't her. She is also having someone make fake profiles of her. This turns into a web, a fucking web that just keeps going. Oh, okay. So was Tracy one of the first three that we were talking about? Mm-mm. Oh, Tracy well, this is a fourth. This is a fourth person on Instagram, a fourth young woman on Instagram mm-hmm. who this photographer knows personally. Mm-hmm. And now he's saying to Zoe, mm-hmm. is it Zoe that this is happening to? Yeah. He's saying to Zoe, like, hey, it, it may look like it's that it's Tracy, but it's not Tracy. That is a spoof account of Tracy as well. Correct. Got it. Mm hmm. So this person who isn't Tracy keeps sending her messages and Zoe is scared and has no idea who this is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back to Abby, the fire breather. Yep. She is in Ibiza, Spain on vacation with her family and her boyfriend. And she's having a great time. She's meeting all kinds of people, making new friends, posting about it on her socials. She meets a woman named Lexi and Lexi invites her out on a boat with some other ladies. They have an amazing time. They rode out to a private beach with like, there's like a party going on out there with all these cool people, right? These are all women in their early 20s. Right. And Ibiza, we've talked about this because we've been to Ibiza on the podcast before. Oh, what happened in Ibiza? Haven't we? I feel uh, like we have. But anyway, no, probably. Ibiza is like, it's like Europe's like spring break. Oh, is that right. where they went? No, that was something Golden Beach. What's the guy's name who ran out of the airport and never came back? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they're getting cray, right? Out on this private island. Mm -hmm. When Abby gets back home, she gets a message from Jody on WhatsApp, who was one of the women she met on her trip. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Josie. And Josie says, can I tell you a secret? Then she said, I know what you did. And Abby like was like, I know what you did last summer. Yes, I hate it. <laughs> what? What? Uh, and Abby's like, Oh no, did I do something wrong? Whatever. And Jody accuses Abby of talking to Lexi's boyfriend, Rick. And Abby was like, No, I haven't talked to him. Where did you hear that? So Abby sent Lexi 
a text message and was like, hey, your friend Jody reached out to me on WhatsApp and said that I was speaking to your boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. Josie. Yeah. Is it Josie? Okay. I th- you yeah. keep saying Jody. I think okay. it's Jody. I think I typed Josie and it's Jody. Oh, it is Jody. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Mm-hmm. So anyway, she reaches out to Lexi like, hey, your friend Jody is like telling me that you're thinking I talked to your boyfriend. Yeah. Today. Like, are we cool or what? Uh huh. And so Lexi gets a hold of Jody and uh-huh. Jody's like, I didn't message her, send her a message at all on WhatsApp. I don't know what she's talking about. So Abby's relieved and figures there was just some sort of weird mix up and doesn't think much of it. Okay. A week later, Abby notices that her boyfriend is being really distant. So Abby finally asks him what's wrong. And he says, I know you've been cheating on me. Oh no. Mm -hmm. Did Jody tell him that? No. There were two separate women who have DM'd him on Instagram and told him, that Abby was cheating on him and that you went out to the club. And I know it's true because both of these women described what you were wearing that night. Creepy. (laughs) So Abby asked to see these accounts of these women and they both appear to be about her age and they both have very active social media accounts and it appears to all be legit, but Abby doesn't know who these women are or why they are telling her boyfriend that she's cheating. And ultimately, her boyfriend doesn't believe her, and he ends the relationship. And Abby is devastated. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And the whole, the message that started the conversation from these women on Instagram to the boyfriend started with, can I tell you a secret? Oh. It's so creepy. Okay. I hate it. Uh-huh. Uh, Now to Leah. Leah is in Kent, which is in the southeast region of England. She works as a paralegal and every day she took the train to the office. And one night she gets a message from someone who has a profile name of Rachel. But the message says, sorry to interrupt you, babe. I have something to tell you. Can I try? Is this also on Instagram? She didn't say what platform it was, but this person is on all the all the things. Okay. Mm hmm. And sorry to interrupt you, babe. I have something to tell you. Can I trust you? And Leah doesn't know who this person is. So she chose to ignore it and she just went to bed. The next morning, she had a bunch of messages from several different accounts. Some of these accounts are friends and families of her. And they're telling her that they got a weird message from someone they didn't know, asking them if they knew her. So Leah makes a post on her socials saying, You know, if you get any notifications from this Rachel person, make sure to report and block. I don't know who this is. I don't, I don't know what this is about. And this, you know, makes things much, much worse for her. So pretty soon, every single person that Leah is friends with on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and WhatsApp are all getting messages from this Rachel person. Yeah. Then this person makes a fake account of Leah and is reaching out to all of the men on Leah's friend group, most of which are either her friend's husbands or family members. And the messages are extremely sexual in nature. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. And some of the men even show up to Leah's house because they believe they have been invited over. (gasps) Mm Hmm. Okay. Well, first of all, Okay. First of all, those men are disgusting. Mm -hmm. Right. Second of all, they're all fucking delusional. Mm -hmm. If they did not even consider that that was not a real invitation. Right. Right. But like delusional and disgusting go hand in hand with so many men. (laughs) Delulu. (laughs) Just like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Come on. And like no diligence, like no fucking diligence. Yeah, call her phone, and if you get her voice to confirm, then maybe. Right? Yeah, like, ask some clarifying questions. Seriously. (laughs) God. Off I go. If these were were (laughs) any of the, like, boyfriends or, like, married partners of, like, anyone that she knew, like, that's fucking men. 
Yeah, fucking men. But then, so not only that, but her friends are texting her and they're angry because they believe yeah. that Leah is having inappropriate contact with their husbands and boyfriends. And she is right. like devastated. So now we Nobody is verifying that it's not coming from her real account. I think it, it just keeps getting worse. And I think because it was so, it was so much and it was so sophisticated how these accounts were being made that they were like, she didn't believe her. And so anyway, like so far, like the whole point of this is just to like ruin people's lives. Like Abby's boyfriend yes. has left her. Leah's friends don't want her around their husbands. Like, right. Right. Okay. Yes. Right, right, right. So back to Zoe, the model. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's getting over 100 messages per day now. And she's looking at everybody that she encounters and suspects everyone. And whoever this is seems to be getting more information about her. This person knew where she went to the gym. And Zoe lives alone. And she has no idea if this person knows where she lives. She is keeping screenshots of all the messages, but not responding. In one of the messages, the person says, we can talk when I see you next. <laughs> Oh, now do all three of these women live in the same town or in the same area? They're all in different parts of England and they do not know each other and they have no mutual friends. But the other gal, it wasn't Zoe that was in Ibiza. It was Abby, right? It was Abby. Yeah. And they knew what she was wearing when she was there. Yeah, but she was also posting a whole bunch I of... I was going to say she mm -hmm. was posting, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So she's keeping all the screenshots. They say, I'll talk to you when I see you next. Then one night she gets a text from her friend who says, hey, are you messaging me? And Zoe says, no, what number is it from? And the friend sends her the number. So then she gets a message that says, hi, Zoe. It's Nathan from the gym. And the number is the same one that her friend had just sent her. So she's like, holy shit, the weirdo is Nathan from the gym. Maybe. Okay. So she calls the gym and talks to Nathan and she says, did you just message me? And he says, no, you just messaged me. What? And, oh, yes. And she's like, no, I didn't. And so he reads her the text and it says, hey, it's Zoe. He he. What number do you have on record for me? So Nathan responded thinking it was Zoe, which gave the stalker Zoe's number. Shit. Mm -hmm. yeah then she starts getting phone calls and the caller is just breathing heavily into the phone but not Ugh. saying anything no ew heavy breathing phone I mouth oh, I mouth it. breather mm -hmm. Ugh. Mm -hmm. oh I hate this so much I do too it's so creepy okay so back to Abby fire dancer she does live streams quite a bit showing her performances and she gets the attention of a local photographer named Lee so she meets up with Lee and Lee's great. He's legit. He's awesome. They do this great photo shoot. And so she meets up with Lee. Uh, Let's do a photo shoot. And she does. What are those sexy ones called? That are like. like yeah. So she's like, you know, and she's super excited about the shoot. And sh she does it for herself and for a select few people that she will deem acceptable to see these. Right. They're not going on social media or anything. Right. Right. And so she's super excited. And shortly after she gets a text message from an old coworker that says he had been in an ongoing flirty conversation. And he was just now realizing that he wasn't actually talking to her, but he wanted her to know that the person who was pretending to be her sent him nude photos. And, and Abby, she's like, this guy is like my dad's age. And like, he, Ew. And he thinks he's, and he was engaging in that. This is, mm, I know, like there in, are so many bad, there are so many shitty men in this in story already. What I can't world? Remember. In what world? So, <sighs> this coworker is older, and this type of interaction would have never happened, according to Abby. So, she asks this coworker to send her the photos that he received, and the photos are from the shoot that she just did with Lee. What the fuck? Mm hmm. So within a few hours after learning all of this, Lee calls Abby and he's apologizing. And he said that he was talking with someone who said they were Abby and they asked if he could resend the photos. So he did. 
But this person knew that she had done these photos. Yes. Yes. <sighs> so just like Zoe, Abby is so upset and scared. She is suspecting everyone in her life and she has no idea if it's one person or several people. And she really feels that it had to be someone close to her since they seemed to be able to like mimic her so well and get people who know her to believe that it is her and they know her goings on that are personal, right? Like it's yeah. just spooky. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back to Leah, he's still reaching out to her friends and saying horrible, hateful things, causing rifts in all of her relationships. And so Leah is starting to completely withdraw from her social life. She's like, Nope, I'm not even gonna go anywhere. She has her mom drive her anytime she goes somewhere. And she has someone walk her in and out of wherever she's going. And she has her mom pick her up. And she's like, in her 20s, she works as a paralegal. And she's like, you know, she's terrified. Zoe purchases a sword that she keeps by her bed. And Aunt Abby ends up moving back in with her parents. <laughs> That's incredible. A sword. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that tracks for a fire breather. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Abby. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So she says that she went from having a really rich, robust life to being scared all of the time and not able to trust anyone. Right. So one night, Zoe's out with friends. When that number calls her, her friend said, oh, let me answer this. So her friend, <laughs> so her friend Lily answers so Zoe's Zoe phone. Still has, so, so Zoe still has some friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leah's the one whose friendships are just tanking. Oh, right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. So Lily answers the phone and says, hey, creep, leave her alone. And he hangs up. And seconds later, Lily gets a text that says, hi, Lily, how is Phil? And Phil is Lily's dad. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. This is reminding me a little bit about uh, I prefer lemons. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> Right? Yes, that family. They never figured it yes. out. They never figured it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this person knows everything about all three of these women, but at this point, none of these women know that there are other victims. Right. Okay, so Zoe goes to the police and she's basically told that if she's going to be sexy on social media, what did she think would happen? Mm -hmm. If I could. I would flip a motherfucking table right now. You you know what? You you were dressed that way, so you fucking asked for it. Fuck right off. Leah goes to the police and she is told that there was no crime. And that nothing had happened to her yet. Mm -hmm. And after going to the police, Zoe gets a message that says, Babes, the police can't do anything. Nobody knows who I am. Now I'm reminded of that other story. Paul, the fucker in the bushes? No, the oh. one, the gal that was stalked, we did an update on her case because you got Karen. So wrong. Yes. yes. Karen, okay. First, because you. you got so much of it wrong. That's not what I, you didn't let me finish because the show you watched got so much of it wrong. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm but I'm reminded of Karen. Defensive. Like, oh, mm -hmm. what? there's nothing, you know, nothing illegal is happening here. So I don't know what to tell you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Abby decides to leave town with a friend and she goes to Ibiza. And that's when she gets a message that says, I know you're going to Ibiza. Beware. I'm going to find you and you'll get hurt. Not in a violent way, but in other ways. Nobody fucks around with me. Okay. I hate this motherfucker. Mm hmm. Yeah. So after this, Abby goes to the police and the police tell her that they don't think she's in immediate danger. Sorry. Bye. What? Mm hmm. I know. I know. Okay. So then in July of 2019, Zoe gets a message from her ex-boyfriend and he says, I just got this strange message from someone. And he sends her a screenshot and the name on this account was Matthew Hardy. So Zoe gets online and looks up this profile. And this one looks very different from the others. In the past, it was people who could possibly be linked to her, like other models or photographers. But this Matthew Hardy just looks like an average dude. So she puts his name into the Google and an article comes up from 10 years prior about hacking into Facebook accounts and using it to harass and stalk women. Oh, 
And I'm not sure like if he slipped up or didn't crop it well enough again. And his name was still on there. He has another, he has another slip up, but we'll get to that. So the next time she received a message, she called him out and addressed him as Matthew. Oh, she's like, Hey, Matthew. And he responds with just a question mark. So she Mm -hmm. replies, Matthew Hardy. And he replies, you know who I am. And Mm -hmm. she asks him, why are you doing this? And he doesn't respond. Coward. Yeah. So back to Abby, her and her friend log on to an Instagram live together. And someone by the name of Morris, who says he is a photographer, logs into the live and he is saying weird shit. Mm -hmm. And this Morris person writes Matthew Hardy. Like he writes it on the you know, the little chat bubbles that go up as you're live streaming. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. So Abby types Matthew Hardy into Facebook and up pops a profile of a regular looking dude who lived over 100 miles away in Northwich. Mm -hmm. So Northwich police one day get a call from a mom who says that her son, Matthew had a brick thrown through his window and it had something to do with social media use. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) so northwich officers start to investigate it's just one officer it's just this one lone dude who Mm -hmm. is like the only decent officer in this whole fucking shit hot mess the whole country i mean like every country has one (laughs) (laughs) So he starts by looking up Matthew and he finds a treasure trove of information going back to 2010 and these accounts of all these older victims of him harassing and stalking and all the things, right? And all of them had messages that started with, can I tell you a secret? Gross. Mm -hmm. And all of these older victims also say that the police never helped them. Well, Well, yeah. So this Northwich officer gets a search warrant and goes to Matthew's house. And he said that the inside of the house was extremely spooky and like sparse. Like he expected to see papers or notes or some sort of system that would allow him to keep track of all these victims. But it actually looked like it was just furniture and nothing else. Like it was a model apartment that nobody lived in. Weird. Like spooky, right? Mm -hmm. So they confiscate all of his electronics and bring him in for an interview. And right when the interview starts, Matthew says he has prepared a statement. (laughs) (laughs) This fucking guy. Uh, He says that he denies all of these allegations against him. He doesn't use social media and he doesn't know any of these people. And every question Mm -hmm. asked of him, he replies with no comment. So... Uh They show him all of the profiles that were made and several of the messages that he had sent. And he just says, no comment, no comment, no comment. Mm -hmm. Finally, when the officer reads off one of the previous victim's statements about how scared she was and how much of her life had been destroyed, Matthew finally says something other than no comment. He says he can understand why someone going through this would be scared and that he can relate because he has been harassed by people who believe that he is the person behind it and that it all stems from an article published 10 years ago. So now he's saying that whoever this is has also hacked him and he is right. one of the victims. Mm-hmm. Fucking meta, dude. Okay. <laughs> so Matthew's old classmates from school said that he was extremely quiet and awkward And that if he had just learned proper socializing, he might have been okay. (laughs) It wasn't until years after school ended that Matthew was diagnosed with autism. And he, Mm -hmm. although he was extremely socially awkward, he was very smart and very tech savvy. It was back when he was still in school that social media became a thing and he was quick to jump on it and he would send messages to different girls in his class. But back then everyone knew that it was Matthew because he hadn't yet finessed his, you know, stalking. Right. But he put a lot of time and thought into this. Mm Mm-hmm. Clearly. Yeah. So... The police are starting to, for a split second, this officer is concerned that Matthew, like he's so good with what he's done that he's a victim too. Right. 
But then when the data comes back from the cyber forensics, they can see that it was Matthew's Wi-Fi and Matthew's router that's doing all of these things, right? Right, right. But then the district attorney comes back and says there isn't enough evidence to charge him. So here is where it gets crazy because so Matthew it, it, here, it starts to get crazy <laughs> here. Uh, okay. Hold on to your butts as they say. Okay. So officer Kevin here again, he's just like a small town officer. officer Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have any cyber crime experience. He's trying to build a case to get Matthew arrested and in custody. Meanwhile, the stalking continues. And Mm -hmm. the shit hit the fan on the evening of Leah's friend's wedding. Matthew had made a fake account and he was able to convince the groom that his future wife was sleeping with his father. Oh, for God. (laughs) (laughs) And he did this using a profile posing as Leah. Okay. Okay, so then Matthew slips up. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hmm. At this point, doesn't everyone in Leah's life know that this is going on? Like, how would this guy fall for this shit if he knew that this was going on? Mm -hmm. I don't think they believe her. Yeah, it's very sad. It's very sad. So Matthew slips up. So one of his older victims before these three gets a text from a friend that says someone has been impersonating me on Instagram. So this friend goes and looks, and this is where Matthew slipped up because he accidentally went live on Instagram for a second (laughs) and then quickly put his hand over the camera. Uh huh. And she was like, oh, that's Matthew Hardy. He's a stalker. Uh You can see his face clearly for a second. And then he freaks out, puts his hand over it and goes off of the live. Right. Right. So that paired with the data that Officer Kevin has, it finally comes all together. And Officer Kevin gets in contact with Abby, Zoe, and Leah. They each finally realize that the other existed. Leah, because she's a paralegal, she comes to meet with um, Officer Kevin with a fucking stack of evidence that is organized (laughs) like a court file. (laughs) Fuck yeah, Leah. (laughs) So after two years of this whole stalking ordeal, he is finally arrested. He ended up pleading guilty in October of 2022 and was sentenced to eight years in prison. Wow. But it's like, yeah, the point was just to wreak havoc and heartache in other people's lives. Like, why? I I mean, and some people just want to see the world burn. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, there is (sighs) no understanding why. Sorry, that was extra long. But also it's like, I don't know how he did it, but he's so fucking tech savvy. Like imagine what he could have done with his life instead. I mean, this is how many times have we had a conversation like this? That's like some your powers for good. What are we doing? (laughs) Use your powers. That's some sophisticated shit. Yeah. And requires a whole lot of mental organization. Yes. I don't understand. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. And what is he doing with his life that he can afford to spend that kind of time and energy on all of the, I mean, a one is enough, but like three at a time. I have no idea. I have no idea, but it was disturbing and spooky and I wish I hadn't watched it. So there you go. Well, now we all wish you hadn't watched it. Thanks. sister. Sorry. You're welcome. You got some chaos. <laughs> You want uh, you want some chaos? Yes, please. Okay, I'm taking us back yet again to the early 20th century, and we're gonna talk about World War One again, sorta. Great. Yeah. Well, you and our Chaos Kid Club members who listen to this month's bonus episode will recall that we touched a little bit on what made World War One exceptional as far as wars go. Right. That yeah. being the introduction of industrialized weaponry, right. Machine mm-hmm. guns and tanks and planes and that stuff. And how much of the war was soldiers literally like dug into trenches facing off across mm-hmm. no man's lands. Right. One such location was referred to as the Western front where both sides dug into fortified trenches, stretching from, the North Sea to the Swiss frontier in France. And on that Western front, 
the U.S. pulled together what they called the American Expeditionary Force or the AEF, which was servicemen from all branches of the U.S. military. And they totaled over two million men over the course of the U.S. involvement in the war. Wow. Okay. And while World War I officially ended in November of 1918, the last of the AEF was disbanded in August of 1920. And from what I can tell, the history of the United States government not giving two shits about the men they send to war goes way back. Mm -hmm. So these guys came back with all the issues anyone who spent time in battle would have, and they weren't really taken care of. Right. Tale as old as time. That's right. Mm Mm-hmm. So in 1924, after much political battling, a federal bill was passed in May of 1924 called the World War Adjusted Compensation Act, which basically said that these veterans of the war were due compensation or a bonus, as some called it. And President Coolidge had already like vetoed a bill similarly. And the quote that I got about it was patriotism Bought and paid for is not patriotism. Oh, you just do it for the love of your country. That's exactly right. Okay. The bill itself was often referred to as the bonus act. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the practice of wartime military bonuses began all the way back in like 1776 as payment for the difference between like what a soldier earned and what he could have earned had he not enlisted. And it, it actually derived from an English practice going way back to like the late 1500s. So this is not unprecedented stuff, but ultimately Congress would veto, like would override Coolidge's veto. Okay. So the, the, the act would go through the bill itself. I already said this was, it was often referred to as the bonus act, like colloquially. Right. Mm-hmm. So but it wasn't cut and dry. There was an amount calculated for each veteran based on the number of days served and whether they went abroad or not during that service. And there was a cap on the total that any one veteran could receive. Okay. And it came in the form of basically an IOU. They (laughs) called it a certificate, but it was not redeemable until their birthday in 1945, unless the amount due was under like 50, 50 bucks. It did earn interest, but they had to wait like 20 years. 20 years? Well, yeah, because this passed in 1924 and they couldn't collect on it until their birthday in 1945. Wow. Cool. They were, however, permitted to use the certificate as collateral for certain loans beginning in 1927. Okay. And then, of course, came Black Thursday and the stock market crash of 1929 that kicked off the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And it was really bad. Mm -hmm. Construction ground to a halt. Crop prices fell by 60%, which obviously hit farming communities really hard. And because the economy was basically collapsing, unemployment shot through the roof. And as we know and would expect, that meant that so did houselessness. Yeah. Yeah. One of the effects of this was that any infrastructure that existed at the time to feed and house the houseless population was beyond overwhelmed. And so people did what they had to do. They started building makeshift houses, shanties really, mostly from scraps of wood, metal, cardboard, whatever they could get their hands on, often very near existing soup kitchens. And so these makeshift communities were springing up all over And because President Herbert Hoover was largely blamed for the Great Depression by Democrats, they started calling these homeless, these houseless encampments, Hoovervilles. Mm. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Famously, there was one in Seattle Mm -hmm. that actually was so well organized. They had their own like government within the houseless encampment. Perfect. Mm hmm. And they had a name. They named themselves something. Anyway, by 1931, the Great Depression was really settled in and times were rough all around. And some of Congress were in favor of allowing early disbursement of payment on these bonuses to veterans. Mm -hmm. But Hoover and his Republicans in Congress were like, well, we'd have to raise taxes to pay those out. And that's not going to work in this economy. 
So the organization Veterans of Foreign Wars continued to pressure the federal government to pay them out anyway. And while the vets could get loans on these certificates by 1932, the banks didn't have the funds to give. Right. Fuck. So in May of 1932, a real movement began. Jobless World War I veterans organized a group and called themselves Bonus Expeditionary Forces, or BEF, and they marched to Washington, D.C. They were going to demand that Congress pay up. Mm -hmm. Led by Walter W. Walters. Stop it. Stop you it. W, you think the W stands for Walter? Is it Walter, I, Walter, Walters? I hope so. God, I hope so. I might as well just keep it going at that point. <laughs> Walter, Wally, Walters. Oh, my God. I fucking love it. <laughs> I knew you would. <sighs> we talk about this too much. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. So led by Walter, they set up camps and occupied buildings in various locations around Washington, D.C. They even had their own shantytown or Hooverville, if you will, on the Anacostia Flats, now a part of Anacostia Park. that was a swampy, muddy area away from the federal core of D.C. In fact, on the other side, like outside of D.C. proper. Mm -hmm. Technically, this occupation on federal land was against the law, but Pelham Glassford, who was at that time superintendent of the D.C. police, as well as a World War I vet, made an off-the-books deal with the director of public buildings and public parks in D.C. that they would basically, like, let it slide. Right. There's a, there's a, a camp that sets up in Anacostia Flats, but there's other little camps in D.C. proper and also some like what they called half demolished buildings or whatever in town Mm -hmm. that people also are like kind of occupying. Okay. Okay. So they're not all in one place, but they have all converged on D.C. and the surrounding area. The camp was built in the historically African-American section of Anacostia next to tennis courts and a baseball field where the kids would play. The total occupying protesters in D.C. was estimated around 43,000. About 17,000 of them were vets and their families, and then the rest were like affiliated groups. Mm -hmm. At this point in history, this was the largest demonstration on the capital of the United States to date. Shit. And they were righteous. I mean, most of these vets had been out of work since the crash and the start of the depression. The veterans weren't without any support in Congress. One congressman tried to get the war department to set up some housing for these guys, which they declined to do. So the protesters did what all the Hoovervilles did. They collected scraps from junk piles and built what they could with what they had on hand. Yeah. Eventually, this part of the occupation on Anacostia Flats was named Camp Marks after the friendly police captain, S.J. Marks. There's a friendly police captain? There's a a friendly police captain. There's the one in that town. Well, great. That's right. (laughs) And these guys were super organized. I mean, there are ex, you know, these are ex-soldiers who know how to put shit together, right? So Camp Marks was tightly controlled. They laid out streets built sanitation facilities, set up an internal police force and held daily marches through DC. They really had a community going. There was a religious tent where protesters would, you know, preach and to each other about patience and restraint and trust in God and gratitude that many of them were still doing better than other people in the country during this depression. The Salvation Army had a lending library that included a makeshift post office where protesters could write and send letters home. It was said that postage stamps were more prized than cigarettes at that time. Oh, shit. I even saw a picture of a postage stamp that was like in support of the Bonus Army. Really? Oh, my God. Yeah, like the post office actually made a stamp to support them. That, that'd be a cool collector piece if you were a stamp collector. Right? Yeah. Right? They even set up a system to allow people to live in Camp Marks. Men had to register and provide proof that they had served in World War I and had been honorably discharged or provide a bonus certificate. Mm -hmm. Good. And Glassford worked with camp leaders to provide food and supplies to the camp. So the demand was really pay our bonuses now. 
right? And mm-hmm. the House of Representatives put together a bill sponsored by Wright Patman, a Democratic rep from Texas who was himself a World War I vet, that would pay out at a total cost to the federal budget of $2.4 billion. Whew. Which I read somewhere in like 2021 would be equivalent to like 30 or $33 billion. That's a hefty amount. Mm -hmm. During the debate over the bill on June 15th. Now, side note, I'm not sure how long the occupation had been going on at this point since it started in May, but I couldn't find a definitive start date. Mm -hmm. But this would imply at least two weeks, as many as six, since the vets and their families had started arriving to protest and pressure federal leadership to help them. Gotcha. Anyway, June 15th, the House of Reps debates this bill. And in the middle of this debate, Congressman Eslick was addressing his peers on the House floor and he died of a heart attack in the middle of it. What? And the House carried on with its business and they passed the bill that day. Shut up. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my. Well, you know. There's shit to do. They got shit to do. Keep it moving. There's shit to do. Mm-hmm. We got to get these guys out of D.C., man. Republicans <laughs> were opposed to this bill, mostly because the U.S. government wasn't faring any better than anyone else in this depression. And the federal government didn't have $2.4 billion in the bank to pay this bill if it came due right then. And probably also because there were some who thought that the protesters were infiltrated by criminals and communists trying to foment an uprising against the government. Mm hmm. Sure. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. 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 And it's no coincidence that criminals and communists were lumped together as one bad element within the group. <laughs> right. And there is there is evidence that communists did join the bonus army on their trek to D.C., but they weren't really welcomed by the protesters and, in fact, regularly booted them, tore up their leaflets and had a saying amongst their slogans just for the communists, which was eyes front, not left. <laughs> OK. Wow. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the bill died in the Senate, a bill that likely would have been vetoed by Hoover anyway, had it passed. Mm -hmm. Roughly 6,000 of the protesters had made their way to the Capitol building during the Senate vote and wandered back to wherever in D.C. they were staying after it was defeated. Hoover had at one point said that, you know, like they lost and there's nothing here for them to rally for anymore. They'll all wander off on their own. Let them dissipate. It's fine. Whatever. (laughs) But a lot of them stayed and Hoover decided he wasn't going to let them squat in federal buildings anymore. Because remember, not everyone that was occupying D.C. was in Camp Marx. Mm -hmm. On June 28th, the U.S. Attorney General William Mitchell at the order of President Hoover told the D.C. police to remove the protesters from government property. These were the ones that were occupying buildings along Pennsylvania Avenue, closer to the Capitol buildings. These Yeah, I told you these buildings were described as partly demolished. I don't. So they sounded pretty abandoned uh, to me. There was an estimate of about 50 men still camping out in these federal buildings and D.C. police showed up to give them the boot. Mm -hmm. And these guys pushed back. Uh Oh, also, they're probably not doing anything right. Like, no, give them the boot out of buildings that aren't being used and it's keeping them housed. Right. Cool. Right. Not a lot has changed in almost 100 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. The couple of places I got info on this called these guys rioters. Sure. Which is a word that I'm personally hesitant to use, especially when we're talking about citizens who are fighting for their rights and needs who are standing up against the police force sent to beat them back. But a clash ensued. And then a police officer drew his weapon and shot at these protesters. These unarmed protesters. That's right. Okay. Cool. Two men were killed. William Hushka, an immigrant from Lithuania who had sold his butcher shop in St. Louis and joined the army at the start of World War I and had been living in Chicago after the war. Oh. And Eric Carlson, another veteran of the war from Oakland, California, who had fought in the trenches in France. Both men were interred at Arlington National Cemetery. Jesus. And the clash continued between these protesters and the police. So the army was called in. Mm -hmm. General Douglas MacArthur led the army troops along with his aide, Major Dwight D. Eisenhower. 
and an able tank commander, Major George S. Patton, Mm -hmm. under President Hoover's orders to drive the protesters back across the Anacostia River, the army was in position in the late afternoon. Once the order was given, the troops advanced with tanks, fixed bayonets, and tear gas to drive away the crowd of veterans back across the bridge. Shit. So at 1.40 p.m., General MacArthur ordered General Miles to assemble troops on the ellipse immediately south of the White House. Within the hour, the 3rd Cavalry, led by Patton, at that time still a major, not a general yet, crossed the Memorial Bridge with the 12th Infantry, arriving by steamer about an hour later. At 4 p.m., Miles told MacArthur that the troops were ready, and MacArthur, like Eisenhower, he was now in his service uniform, he said that Hoover wanted him to, quote, be on hand as things progressed so that he could issue necessary instructions on the ground and take the rap if there should be any unfavorable or critical repercussions. Mm -hmm. At 4.45 p.m., commanded by MacArthur, the 12th Infantry Regiment and the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, supported by five tanks commanded by patent formed on Pennsylvania Avenue while thousands of civil service employees left work to line the street and watch. God, gross. The bonus army protesters believing the troops were marching in their honor. Yeah, because those are fellow soldiers. That's right. They cheered the troops until the cavalry turned and charged them, which some say prompted spectators to yell, shame, shame. Jesus Christ. After the cavalry charged, the infantry with fixed bayonets and tear gas entered the camps, evicting veterans, families, and camp followers. These are the smaller camps that had popped up in the city proper. Mm -hmm. The veterans fled across the Anacostia River to Camp Marks, and Hoover ordered the assault to stop. Okay. Twice. Oh, shit. He sent instructions to MacArthur not to cross the Anacostia Bridge that night. Both times, MacArthur received these instructions from his commander-in-chief. MacArthur chose to ignore the president and ordered a new attack, claiming that the Bonus Army was an attempt to overthrow the U.S. government. What the fuck? No, it's not. (sighs) Shortly after 9 p.m., MacArthur ordered Miles to cross the bridge and evict the bonus army from Camp Marks. Mm. The camp was still inhabited by about 10,000 people who were driven off by the cavalry with tanks and tear gas. Then the infantry followed, setting fire to the shanties, and D.C.'s hospitals were overwhelmed with the wounded. Good God. (sighs) 55 veterans were injured and 135 arrested. One veteran's wife miscarried. When 12-week-old Bernard Meyer died in the hospital after being caught in the tear gas attack, a government investigation reported he died of enteritis, and a hospital spokesman said the tear gas, quote, didn't do it any good. You think? Jesus Christ. A 12-week-old baby tear gassed? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fuck, this is dark. Remember, Amber, this is in that same era of like the Battle of Blair Mountain, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Operationally speaking, the exercise was seen as a success by the army. The bonus expeditionary forces had been dispersed permanently. (laughs) There was a lot of finger pointing in the aftermath about who was at fault. Some said that one of MacArthur's junior aides never delivered Hoover's messages not to push past the bridge. Bullshit. He gave it twice. Yes. Others said, yeah, basically called bullshit on that and said MacArthur did receive the messages and ignored them. Mm -hmm. So police superintendent Glassford was pissed that the army was brought in and how it all went down. And very soon after he resigned, Mm -hmm. though the bonus army incident did not derail the careers of the military officers involved, it proved politically disastrous for Hoover. And it is considered a contributing factor to his losing the election that year in a landslide to Franklin D. Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. I could imagine. It's not a good look, Hoover. Not a good look. Not a good look. Mm -mm. The Washington Daily News, typically sympathetic to Hoover's Republicans, called it, quote, a pitiful spectacle to see the mightiest government in the world chasing unarmed men, women and children with army tanks. If the army must be called out to make war on unarmed citizens, this is no longer America. That is so well said. So well. I mean, 
it's not totally true. I mean, right. America's, sure. You know, sure, based sure, sure, on sure, built sure. off a of genocide, but you know, it's the spirit of it. Let's not um, get into the weeds about it now, <laughs> Naomi. <laughs> you know, I'm always ready to get in the weeds. I know. Um, <laughs> Roosevelt also didn't really want to pay the certificates out either. And another group of veterans the following year decided to make another occupation in D.C. with the same demands, although not with the support of the original organizers of the bonus army occupation. Walter Walters was like, no. But, <laughs> sorry. But Roosevelt learned some lessons from Hoover's administration. And when this new round of occupiers demanded they be taken care of while they camped outside the Capitol, Roosevelt obliged. Okay. His administration set up a special camp for the marchers at Fort Hunt, Virginia, providing 40 field kitchens serving three meals a day, bus transportation to and from the Capitol, and entertainment in the form of military bands. <laughs> oh my God. You're like, you know what? Can you save all the money that you just spent on making this a party and just give us our fucking payouts? Thanks. Right? <laughs> God. We don't want to live here and like exist like this. Right? <laughs> yeah. God. Oh. And then, you know, the administration did try to negotiate with the protesters. Roosevelt sent his wife, Eleanor, to visit the site unaccompanied. She had lunch with them, chatted with them, and told them she would get them positions in the Civilian Conservation Corps. One veteran is quoted as saying, Hoover sent the army, Roosevelt sent his wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. On May 11th, 1933, Roosevelt issued an executive order allowing the enrollment of 25,000 veterans into the CCC, exempting them from the normal requirement that applicants be unmarried and under the age of 25. That's the Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. Congress, with Democrats holding majorities in both houses, passed the Adjusted Compensation Payment Act in 1936, authorizing the immediate payment of the $2 billion in World War I bonuses, and then overrode Roosevelt's inevitable veto. Okay. And that is the story. <sighs> wow. Of the bonus army. Jesus sister. Christ. That's terrible. I just wanted to be clear that in this story, mm -hmm. veterans protesting and demanding what they were owed were met by fellow soldiers I know. from the army and pushed out their camp set ablaze their women and their children terrified and injured two men shot mm -hmm. with real weapons real guns mm -hmm. and died and a baby tear gassed and a baby at least one baby tear gas probably more than one I also, baby that died yeah i also yes. wonder if there were any soldiers within the group that was attacking them that were also owed a bonus right it's like what the fuck are you what right <sighs> That's this is what happens with blind loyalty, blind orders. I'm instead of oh god. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So wow. God there damn go, it. Sister. And we still don't <laughs> take care of our vets a hundred years we later. We still do not. We still do we not. We still do not take care of them. Yep. A hundred years later, we still do not take care of them. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Cool. Do you want to sing the national anthem with me as a sign off or <laughs> like, is that the vibe? That is so not the vibe. <laughs> How about apple maggot in a round? Is that the vibe? <laughs> That's always the vibe. That is always the vibe. <laughs> God. Fuck. Well, thank you for that. No, yeah, no, thank you for yours. Mm -hmm. That was uh that was an uh quite the episode we did today. We did it. We did it. Mm -hmm. Um this is dropping on Sunday, and so we will have just dropped a bonus episode for our Chaos Kids Club members. So if you want to get that bonus content, go on over to patreon.com backslash crime wine and chaos and become a Patreon. Five dollars a month gets you a bonus episode every month. It gets you in the queue for our virtual wine night. And then, you know, we drop our episodes a day early now for our, our club members. It's so true. Uh, get it on Saturday instead of Sunday. So go do that. Yeah. Go on your uh, listening app and slap us a review on there. Give us some stars. Give us some feedback. Send us an email, crimewineandchaos at gmail.com. Check out our website. You can submit questions, stories, fun facts there too, crimewineandchaos.com. 
What else? We're on all the things. All the things. Yeah. All the things. Yeah. Oh, sister, I love you. Love you. That was so So fucking chaotic. Goodbye. Records. Artwork by Joshua M. Davis. Music by Paul Abner. If you would like to support the show, you can visit our Patreon page at Crime Wine and Chaos forward slash Patreon. Cheers. Uh, I want to get the right um, information here, so you know, give me give me a minute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold. I, I this is important.